Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the sweltering sunset safari here at Wild Earth. This is Safari Live. My name is James Hendry. On camera, we have got six foot three of Brian Joubert. He is dressed in a buff and he has painted his thumb in an astonishingly original fashion. In the final control, we have got Kirsten on the keys and Jerry on the audio. And on the other vehicle, a rare treat. Stefan Winterboer is no longer the mystic boer, but he is out driving with Andrew Francis as Brent and Jamie have gone to meet Brent's in-laws. <laughs> now... There are some elephants just up ahead, and while you look at them, they're not that happy to see us for some reason. They have been sort of walking away from the vehicle as we've moved in, but there are a whole lot in this woodland, in this sparse woodland with withered leaves on it. All of them withered from the heat, wilting from the heat. And while you're watching them, please remember, you can talk to us at any stage. Hashtag Safari Live or questions at wildearth.tv. Right, here he comes. You can tell this is a bull. Can you tell he's a bull, Ryan? I can. Good. Dad, I don't have to explain that to you. Now, he looks to be in, well, I wouldn't say must necessarily. I can't smell him. I can't smell of that any that green penis syndrome that occurs when they are in must, but he, did you see the way he walked towards us with that sort of swagger? Now that swagger is indicative of some kind of heightened state of, probably not stress, of testosterone. He may well be coming into must and looking for a lady. Beautiful elephant bull, this one. He's not... He's not quite at full size yet. He will get a little bit bigger than that. I'd put him at about 25 to 30 years. And of course, elephants don't stop growing until the day that they shake off this mortal coil. So I think he will get substantially larger than he is now. There are, I suspect a few of the other elephants around here are younger bulls who have perhaps joined him as what we call ascaris, or basically sort of the hang-alongs, if you like, tag-alongs to whom he will provide some form of mentorship. We're just gonna sit here. I don't wanna start the car because he was moving away from us and then he moved a bit closer now. So let's just sit here for a while and see what transpires. Please just do remember that we'd love to hear from you throughout the afternoon. Questions at wildearth.tv, hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. I think you can send through comments from YouTube. I'm not sure exactly how that works. Whatever platform you happen to be using, talk to us. Tell us what you want to see. Tell us your feelings of seeing the largest animal, the largest land animal in the world, live from the northeastern corner of South Africa. query from Micah in the Netherlands. Micah, you want to know if a giraffe or elephant happened to be eating leaves in a tree and they came across a flat-necked chameleon, would they A, shake it off, or B, see it as extra protein and possibly squish it between their teeth and swallow it down? Micah, I suspect quite strongly that they would do A, shake it off. In the case of a giraffe, of course, They've got very small sort of prehensile lips, so they're quite careful about what they select. They're not indiscriminate, and even that elephant, which looks like it's feeding fairly indiscriminately, just, you know, sort of tearing off leaves from branches, they're quite selective. They touch and they feel just about everything they eat before they select it and put it in their mouths. Well, I mean, if you were to ask me, was it possible that a chameleon in history had been eaten by an elephant, I'd say it was highly possible. I've never thought of it, but I think that you will find the odd elephant will go, oh, I wonder what that was. That was a bit squishy and gross. 
I've no doubt they eat plenty of caterpillars and things, you know, when they're picking off leaves like they're eating there. And plenty of grasshoppers. There's a young elephant calling. Plenty of uh, spiders when they're eating grasses and grazing. Great question. Thank you, Micah. All the way in the Netherlands, where I don't believe elephants are too thick on the ground these days. I'm still just going to sit right where I am because this elephant in front of us is very happily eating his Combritum calinum or variable bush willow tree. There are others coming a little bit closer now, one to the right hand side. There, Brian, he's, he's just kind of coming through the woodland. And on a normal summer's day or in a, in a year when we'd had sort of standard issue rain, you wouldn't be able to see that elephant. He'd be hidden by the foliage. There, he's watching us very carefully as he goes past. But he's beautifully kind of, not silhouetted, but shaped, I guess, framed within this almost autumnal kind of woodland, even though we're nowhere near autumn yet. There he goes. that shouting, which I'm sure you heard, that kind of which sounded like a Tyrannosaurus rex, was not a Tyrannosaurus rex. It was, in fact, an elephant. And the elephant was probably just upset about something. They all seem to be streaming from their temporal glands, which means that they are quite stressed out. And I think that stress, I suspect, quite strongly is brought on by nutritional stress and probably water stress as well. and ease a little bit forward now to see if we can't get a view of the others. But I don't want to chase this big hole off. Likewise, I don't want him to chase us, really. Now, that beep, beeping noise that you can hear the all of GoPro cameras that we have on the front of the vehicle. And that ball of GoPro cameras at the moment is a virtual reality rig. And what it allows you to do is film in 360 degrees. Well, actually film in a sphere. So when you watch the footage, you would be able to, you sort of take the position of where the GoPro rig is. You'd look at the elephant and you could turn your head around or turn the device that you were watching it on around and look at me if I pointed things out. And then look above you if a bird flew over the top of us. He's gone up to that knob thorn tree. I'm going to move a little bit more. It's not that clean on us. Tree's going to be in some spot of bother. Don't push it over any. What we're going to do, everybody, while I answer the question from Eric in Virginia Beach, just go around. There's a nice clearing that side. Eric, you want to know about the must rumble? And can humans hear the must rumble? Um, Eric, I've never heard of a specific must rumble. And what Eric's talking about, everybody, is that elephants, of course, communicate with infrasound, uh, sound waves of no energy that we can't hear, waves too wide for us to hear. And Eric, I do think they call more when they're in must, but I don't think that there's a specific must rumble. We can hear some at the higher end of the frequencies of the rumbles they make, but otherwise we don't hear, it, hear them much. I think we're going to leave these guys, everybody, because they seem to be heading off into the thick bush, and that bull doesn't really want to have anything to do with us. Okay, so our plan, 
Our plan for the afternoon is to go up towards Sydney's dam, where, of course, those wild dogs were this morning. Extremely exciting stuff that Jamie had with them up at Sydney's dam. And that's, of course, across the boundary from us. But we will just go and check what's going on there. Then we are also going to go and just see what else is happening. It is some of the last water around the place. So any animals that are on this reserve, they may be going there. Any animals looking for something to eat might be coming out of there. So while we're on our way there, let's head across to the Mystic Boer, Stefan Winterboer. He is on the far eastern boundary looking where we heard some impala alarm calling earlier today. Enjoy it and I'll see you shortly. Good afternoon, after a little bit of a break from presenting for a while. Um, I'm Stefan Winterbull, for those of you who, uh, who are meeting me for the first time, and I want to say hello to all of those that I've shared experiences like this with before over the last couple of months, and um, probably approaching a year soon. I can't believe how fast we are approaching the middle of the year again. And uh, May, April, May is just around the corner. That's when I started this wild earth. Can you believe it? Time marches on. Myself and Andrew have decided that we are going to look for uh, a male leopard that, whose tracks we had on walk this morning. I was uh, the security detail for James, for the third pair of eyes for James and Andrew this morning. And we were tracking a male leopard for a while. We lost his tracks in some very, very thick bush. But he was generally heading in this direction. And while we were doing a little bit of a segment on, I think, a succulent that they had found, I did hear impala barking coming from this area. Now we have passed some impala, but they all look healthy. None of them have managed to climb a tree using a leopard helmet. Um, so we're still coming into this area. We're going to infiltrate it from the area the tracks are coming to and see if we can pick up anything. Now, what I can tell you is that it has been quite hot, but we have got a nice cloud cover that's come over. I'm not going to say anything more. I don't really want to jinx anything that's happening. I doubt anything serious is going to come of it. It's uh, probably about 60% overcast at the moment, which is lovely because I'm not getting burnt to a crisp here. Now, you may be wondering where are James and... Uh, not James, excuse me. Where are Jamie and Brent? They have gone into town. Uh, town trips here tend to last a lot longer, and they didn't want to be late, so they asked me if I wouldn't mind taking their, their trip or their safari for them. <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> Some dust in the air getting into my nasal cavities. Please excuse me for that. All right. So I want to take a quick trip in here and have a look. See what we can find. I am looking on the floor in the most likely place it is to get tracks. And that's not here, as you can see in front of us. Here it would be quite difficult to see tracks. And so I'm going to take the time to look around into the bush and scan where I think a leopard might be lying. And then when we get to a most likely place to look for, for, for a track, it would be a sandy patch on a corner or going through just before a mitre drain. We then, um, we then look there for tracks. It makes it a bit easier to cover all your something lying underneath the bush. But it's quite dry this part of the reserve. We didn't see or hear life today on our walk and we were walking around in this area. And that is because although there's quite a lot of plant cover up there, there's not a lot of water. I think animals are moving into and out of these areas quite frequently. In their movement between water and food. change of pace. All right, so as Brent told you yesterday, I have no doubt, looks like Karula may have moved to a den site. We were fully expecting her to do that. Female leopard moved their den sites 
It's difficult to say. We see so few of them, but they move them every couple of days or when the smell around the den gets too intense or when there's been a lot of predator pressure uh, in the area, they move their den. There's absolutely no footprints of her around that area and it looks like she may have moved it uh, a couple of days ago. Um, we did find some fresh footprints of her. We did find some fresh footprints of her this morning from last night. Looks like she was hunting around the Bufflesworth Dam area. I think I'll go through that area a bit later just to see if we can pick up any, any tracks. There's some Nyala inside there. So as Andrew zooms in onto what basically just becomes a rusty colored bush. You can see that that is a Nyala U. Lovely stripy coat and that rusty brown color that they are. They've just moved off into the bush, into the thickets. They are browsers, which means that they eat leaves and twigs. And they belong to the same group of antelope that kudu and bushbuck belong to and are, for me at least, easily the prettiest. Now they are moving into some thick bush, we will carry on. The reason why I stopped for little things like that is twofold. One is that they're quite nice to look at. And two is that it's only really when the car is switched off that you get to listen to the bush around you. And that's how you find leopard. You stop, you listen, you react mostly. Monkeys calling, animals giving, alarm calls. That's really, for me, the only way to find them. I'm not the, the most gifted tracker, but I definitely do not possess that weird luck that Brent Leo Smith has of being able to just pick any direction and walk into or drive into spotted cats. All right, now this is, if I were to pinpoint on a map, where I thought those alarm calls were coming from today, this would be the area. There's an open area in front of us, and it is frequented by Impala. In actual fact, I can see an Impala down the road there. And of course, as we zoom in, it will walk away. <laughs> <laughs> it is just one of those things. But it does give us another time just to listen to the bush around us. That impala didn't look like it was attached to a leopard in any way. Oh, there he, sorry, Andrew, they're back in the road. <laughs> Shows you how quick things can happen. Apparently, barren stretch of road now has an animal in it. Two animals, three animals. I remember uh, we went, when I was first working as a, as a young guide, the reserve I was on went through a contraction of traverse area. We, we, only, we had a lot of cars driving on a really small piece of ground. And uh, it was absolutely amazing for me in that you could have three or four cars on the same road and you'd all three or four actually see different things. And so just because a road appears empty at the time that you're looking down, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's nothing there. As would be the case, when we stopped, there was nothing. Now, then there was five, and now there's only one standing on the side of the road. For the rest of it, the bush is deathly quiet here today. It's quite a nice breeze blowing. The breeze came up this morning at about 7 o'clock. We were sitting at Bivelshoek Dam, and James was busy showing you a terrapin, and I was walking around in the bush around the area behind James, and it sounded like something was coming through the bush. I didn't quite know what it was. It first sounded like it was a car that was driving very far away, but it didn't have the same hum. And when I finally figured out what it was, I was hearing the breeze arriving. I could hear the noise of the leaves in the trees rustling before the wind actually puffed lightly against my face. And it was actually a very, very awesome 
experience. It's not every day that you're in a place so quiet you can hear the wind arrive. And what I do want to show you is the civet tree that's in front of us. Uh, Andrew, if you wouldn't mind just going to that thing there. That is a big pile of feces from a civet. They are, they are part of the same family that mongoose or mongoose or mongi or mongooses, however you'd like to say it, uh, are from, the viviridae. And they use latrine sites. And what you're looking at there is a latrine. Now, just because it's quite macabre, civets are well known for making the largest poos per volume of animal on the planet as far as I understand and it's not uncommon for a tiny little civet weighing seven kilograms to deposit up to a kilogram of poo. So that could well be just from one deposit. They eat all manner of things, they eat insects, they eat seeds, they eat scorpions, they eat spiders, they eat bulbs, they eat leaves. And it washes out, and what you see, all the white speckles that you see around it, all those white things there, are actually the bleached, sun-bleached insect carapaces that you're seeing, mainly of millipedes. But very often you'll find a bunch of rodent teeth inside there, rodent bones and teeth, seeds of the jackalberry, and pincers and stings of scorpions. And it's a good idea when you go and dissect that, to get an idea of what insect life is around at the moment, what insect life is most prolific at the moment, or what plants are seeding in the area. It's almost like a newspaper, really. Uh, interesting things about these civet trees. We don't see them often because we go home before they come out, they're nocturnal. But you're welcome to go and research what a civet looks like, the most bizarre animal. Very similar to a North American raccoon is about the the closest similarity that I can give. But uh, we're going to link back to James. I'm sure he's getting excited to tell you something. And see you in a little while. Okay, Yeah, on Ion. Sorry, everybody. I'm going to be with you right now. Um, very good news. Of, uh, you can, Okay, copy that. Um, yeah, and that get the... Stefan, you look so anale. I'm showing off Okay, copy that. Yeah, okay, did you copy that? Right. Okay, everybody. Um, we're just here at the dam. And there obviously... This is where the dogs were earlier on. And there were some elephants and there were some buffalo. And now there are some zebras, some impala. And the impala... The, Dogs have actually just been found, and they are further behind that dam wall and just sort of further north of there. So they've obviously moved a little bit during the course of the day. That's not surprising. I think that they probably wouldn't have been tolerated by the presence, or the elephants certainly wouldn't have tolerated their presence, and nor would uh, the buffalo or the zebra. So they would have moved away from the water and tried to sort of find some peaceful shade without too much activity. I have no doubt that they will start to move during the course of the afternoon, and that will be very exciting. I'm hoping that they're going to come close by to wherever we are. We're going to hang around, sort of around about this area, and perhaps... Perhaps they will end up somewhere around quarantine clearings, chasing hapless antelope about the place. Anyway, that's the story from where we are now. And... What I want to do, if you don't mind, I'm just going to get hold of Steph because there has been a sighting found and I just want to check that he's heard about it. Steph, do you copy Steph? I'll just ask Final Control to get hold of Steph and tell him that he needs to contact me on the Game Drive channel. And they're going to do that. Anyway, it's, like I say, this is some of the last water that there is around here. So this will be a busy time, especially on a warm day like today. It's about 31 degrees Celsius, 88 degrees Fahrenheit, which is actually very pleasant. It's not too hot at all. There's a pl pleasant breeze coming out of the southeast. And the reason that there's so much water here in this dam is that 
Well, it's just an enormous dam. And so I think they probably pump it for a certain amount of time during the year, but it's an enormous dam. So when it's full, it will hold water for years after it gets full. And you can see it starting to go down. Just hold on one second, everybody. Steffi, Tax has got um, the animal that we were following on Nyala Road North this afternoon. I don't know if you want to go there. He's right there with her. I don't think she's close to anywhere um, that she shouldn't be, if you know what I mean. So, yeah, Ste you, Steph and I were yeah. tracking a female leopard around Bufelshoek Dam earlier this morning, everyone. It sounds like Taxon has found whoever that is. I'm not sure which leopard that is or if it's possible to even view her, but Steph is in and around that area, so he'll find out from Tax while we drive around here. The other exciting thing from around here this morning was Shadow, and she seemed to have been found just the other side of our boundary, unfortunately, inside Smbambili. All right, Brian, I think that we should press on from these parts. What do you say? Mm. Ah, now, hello, Deborah Armchair Traveller. I don't believe I've heard from you for a little while. Deborah? While we are trying to sort of drive along and we're going to head towards the boundary there, the triple M break or the boundary with Simbabili, you want to know how many properties bound Juma directly and Arethusa? Well, there's Bifelshoek here, which is to the north of us. To the south of us, there are three or four different properties. Sorry, excuse me. The three or four different properties that are privately owned. Annette's is one of them, Hoffman's is another one, Little Gowrie is the other. Cheetah Plains and Chitwa Chitwa are, don't border us directly. And then there's Simbambili, which is just north of Arethusa, and to the east of us is Torchwood. And those are the properties that bound us directly. Arethusa, sorry, is also bounded in the south by Shirley's which is also sort of part of Arethusa, some kind of family family split in the, in the property. And then that is bounded by a farm called Marthley, which is possibly the most beautiful part of Londolosi, which is not too far from here. Thank you, Deborah. Bless you, Brian. Brian's got terrible hay fever. This is wonderful stuff. We have a new viewer on YouTube called Are You Correct? Are You Correct? You want to know if we are in the nation of South Africa and B, if we are, need a license to film here. Pam, are you correct? I'm going to ask you, I'm going to tell you the answer to those questions, but I'm going to ask you to tweet us again and tell us where in the world you are asking your question from. It often helps us to answer the question if we know where you're from, so we know kind of what sort of perspective you have. Um, yes, we are in the nation of South Africa. Magnificent South Africa, the tip of the African continent. We're in the northeastern section of that. And do we need a license to film here? If you're in a national park, you absolutely need a license to film. We are in part of a national park. So we're on privately owned land that is conjoined to the national park, which is the Kruger Park. So we don't need an official government license to film here, no. But we do have to get permission from any landowner to film their animals and to film the, their land and then to broadcast it. So we have permission from the owners of Arethusa and Juma to broadcast. And we don't have an official state license because we don't need one on private land. Lovely question. Welcome to it. And please tell us where you're from. And that goes for everybody who's talking to us. We'd love to know where in the world you happen to be because it's fascinating to us to know which parts of the world are watching us here live out of the northeast corner of South Africa. There's a question coming from another new viewer. <laughs> now, 
This person who's getting hold of us has also not told us where she's from, but I'm going to suspect that she's somewhere in the Antipodes. Uh, a fuzzy koala bear is her hashtag or his hashtag. I don't know why I assumed that you are a she. But do you want to know if I've ever had any close calls with a predator where my life was in danger? Um, fuzzy koala bear, I think that I have, I have, I've certainly had encounters with predators where I felt like my life was in danger during the encounter, but perhaps afterwards on thinking about it, yeah, probably not so much. So I've been charged a few times by leopards, once or twice by lions, and that's a very terrifying thing to happen. But normally, if a predator charges you, what it's saying to you is, go away, you're in my space, I want you to leave. It sees you as a threat, it does not see you as something that it wants to eat. Mainly because if you're my size, you're going to be picking your teeth of bones for a long time, uh, but also because we as human beings are seen as predators out here. So fuzzy koala bear, while yes, it's terrifying to stand down a predator charge, if you look back on the reasons for why an animal will charge you, it's normally because they are afraid and they feel threatened by you and therefore they're not charging you to eat you and therefore your life is pretty much safe as long as you react in the appropriate fashion. And the appropriate fashion in this case is to stand dead still and stare the animal down. Right, marvellous. Are you correct? Thank you for sending us that update. You are on the east coast of North America. I'm assuming you mean the United States of America and not Canada. It's wonderful to have you with us. Here, of course, in the southern hemisphere where it is summer. Oh, there's a little squirrel carrying something. Brian, was it carrying? He's now eating it. Can you see it there? It's eating a grass seed, a flower seed. Brilliant. Mm, it is, it's a, it's, a, it's a culm. So there are a whole lot of seeds in there from a piece of grass. Very protein rich, very fat rich. That is a wonderful, wonderful picture. Mm. Isn't that fantastic? So leaving the flowers, you can see, and just eating the seeds out of the husks there. That's so cute. <laughs> Ooh. That is clearly a male squirrel. You see that, Brian? A set of very impressive testicles. Grief, it's obviously mating time for the squirrels. Now having a little rest. This is the one of the best squirrel sightings I've ever had. Sorry, Steph, you have asked a question that has slipped my mind uh, on sighting that quite astonishing rear end on that squirrel. Uh, basically, I forgot everything that I heard for the last three days. So we'll just ask Jerry to read it back to me. Jerry, give me Steph's question. Jerry. Right, here we go. Oh, right, any... Steph, you want to know if there are any herbs or flowers out here that could help Brian with his hay fever? Mm, there are a few that are supposed to be pretty good for colds and flu, but Brian doesn't have colds and flu. He's got... He needs an anal, uh, not an analgesic, a, what was the word I'm grasping for? An antihistamine of some kind. I, I don't know, I, you know what, I've got a book that I'm going to check in. Certainly a, a tea made from Lipia Jovanica, or the Bushman's tea, would probably ease his suffering somewhat. But let's have a look in my book here. It's called People's Plants. And I'll just check if there's anything on hay fever. A lot of the medicinal plants of this country are actually not found in this area. <laughs> I'm 
Brian, would you like to feel this one? What do you use to draw on your thumb every day? Hello, Captain Temper. <laughs> I use Copic markers, which are alcohol-based. So besides having a fancy-looking thumb, I get a bit of a buzz. All right, let's go straight across to Karula. Wonderful news, everybody. That's why I didn't sort of, wasn't very clear on the radio as to what was going on. Steph is with Karula. Fantastic news. He'll keep you updated. Good stuff. Enjoy it. Alrighty, and for those of you who are wondering how Karula's doing, there she is. Looking in absolutely perfect, perfect health. A new mom. She's in good condition. You can see her hips are looking good. She's got good muscle development on her thighs. Her shoulders are good. She's not angry. Beautiful condition. So for those of you who are wondering how Karula is doing, there she is. Now she is on the area. She's probably about 300 meters, three, 400 meters away from where we, uh, where we, we think that she's moved her cubs to. Um, although we've had no confirmation of where she's got her babies at the moment. All I can say is that we're gonna have a very quick visual of her. If she crosses this road behind us, we're gonna leaving her alone. I'm just very, very glad that we got to see her. So let's just turn around there. You see me again. We're gonna turn the car around so that we can show you walking in the road. We can say thank you to Tex for finding her for us. Moving off slowly. Now I'm just busy having a look and see if I can see suckle marks on her nipples and she's definitely still lactating. It's always a thing, 80% of all the babies that a leopard has will be lost in this area primarily through hyena and then starvation is the next one and then exposure is the next one. Um, she still looks like she's lactating. She has moved off into that area that we can't go and I'll explain that in a second. Declan has asked me, um, do leopard move their, move their dens often? And yes, absolutely, Declan. They move their dens every couple of days, especially when the babies are small. And they do that so that the, the smell of the den doesn't become overpowering and then becomes a draw card for other predators, mainly things like hyena, other leopard, and lion will prey on the babies of leopard. It's a thing called inter-specific competition. Living staff in the area of Kurula, Maripan Road. She crossed the road to the western side. Now, that is the last uh, that we saw there. just turned onto Maripan Road. Um, I obviously could follow in. From uh, Pilot Channels and Family School. I Digital. obviously could follow her into this area, but I think it's a good time to talk about the restrictions that we've placed on this particular area. Because uh, we know that she's got her... Charge of excuse me, I just want to... Um, Craig, uh, just hold on two seconds for me. I'll be with you now. But she has moved into the restricted area, so at the moment it is a negative sighting. Negative sighting. Okay, um, copy. Thank you. Sorry, I just had to do the, the, the radio procedure. So why that is, is because Texan, who found the leopard, has left me in this area and he's pulled out, which makes me in charge of the, uh, of the sighting. And everyone wanting to know what movement this cat is doing, everyone's quite excited about Karula and, uh, and what's going on, is asking on the radio and will ask me what's going on. But I have switched the radio off. It's a bit naughty of me, but I think I want to try and tackle this, um, how we are looking after Karula, I think, with you. So one of the things we've done is we've come into this area, we know that she had her babies a week ago, we know where she had her babies, and what we did was we immediately zoned this area for off-road driving. So there's no off-road driving, no following Karula, no visiting the den site, no visiting the cubs whatsoever. We're leaving her to her, to her uh, own plans. Um, 
after a week, which happened yesterday, we were going to come in here on foot and come and have a look if we could still see if she was in the same den site. We didn't expect her to be in the same den site, and we did confirm it yesterday. She's not at the same den site, but we don't know where the new den site is. What I can say is this morning, we tracked her this morning onto this road, and now she's going back in the afternoon, back into this area. I'm pretty convinced that the cubs are still in this area and I'm still convinced that it's a good idea to keep this area a zoned or a restricted area. And that's just one way we help leopard moms in this, in this Sabi Sands game reserve. Uh, just get on with the business of being a mother. It's hard enough being a mom um, and you don't need the added pressure of vehicles as well, you know, when you're trying to do all your things. So we just leave new leopard moms alone for a long time. And we really just wait for the leopard moms to show us their babies rather than another way around. As you would have remembered from that shot though, she's looking very healthy, that's a good thing. Producing milk is from a metabolic point of view, a very uh, difficult thing for a body to do. So she's looking well nourished, that's a good thing. She's looking calm. She, if she was looking stressed, she would have been running away from vehicles uh, and growling, snarling, charging at cars. She was looking calm. She was just being her old self, which is always a good thing. Um, and I could see evidence that her nipples were still quite enlarged. Even though she had that dewlap on her belly, uh, which is common for a new mom, I did still see evidence of her nipples being enlarged, and that's a good sign. It shows that she's still got some milk. So I'm convinced that her babies are still alive. Um, and let's hope that in the next couple of weeks uh, and months we get to enjoy motherhood with her. That's the, that's the hope. She's a successful mom. She's an old leopard. She knows exactly what she's doing, and I'm convinced that, uh, that we'll see those cubs out on the road with us quite soon. But that's it, that was the sighting. I'm glad we got it. It was only a couple of minutes, I know, and I'm sorry that it couldn't have been longer, but excuse me, I'm just busy swatting a fly that's bothering me. But I'm glad that we got to see her and I'm glad that we've, we've got to get a sort of snapshot as to her condition at the moment, all positive things. So, all right, let's carry on going. And while we are carry on going, we're gonna send you back to James. Right, everybody. Well, here we go. As I'm sure, I don't know if you got the question about Brian's thumb. Brian used alcohol-based... Copic markers. Copic markers, which don't... They're not permanent, right? You could wash them off. Yes, very good. And the other thing you used, they're xylene-free, right? That yes. was what you were worried about before. Not very good for you. Now, I did find a plant for Brian. I've seen it here. I couldn't tell you where it is at the moment. It's called centella. And apparently it's a, I think it's actually, it's, the common name is Indian pennywort. And I'm not sure that it's actually found here naturally, but it's certainly, I've definitely recognized the plant. And throughout Gazankulu, which is the area that we're in now, it's used as a spinach and to treat all sorts of things, including fever, diarrhea, leprosy, tuberculosis, cancer, and rheumatoid arthritis. Whew. It's also used as an anti-inflammatory and anti-allergic. So that's what we need. If you see that, we're going to get Brian to chew it. Centella Asiatica, the Indian penny wart. Excited. I'm excited too. Right, we're going to go now. We're on the main access road where you last left us, of course. And how was Karula? I hope she was good. I'm glad she headed into that area where we aren't allowed to go into that zoned area. It probably means that the cub is okay. Brilliant. And I'm very pleased that Steph can still see some suckle marks. All right, I'm now going to try desperately to start this car. Yay! Okay, and we're gonna go on to the boundary between us and Simbambalai and see if we can't pick up tracks of Shadow or indeed Shadow herself, daughter of Karula, the great queen. Now, I heard somebody say, did, was Tandi seen around here today? So I want to just ask you, if you were with Jamie this morning on drive, was there a confirmed sighting of Shadow or do we think it could have been someone else? Because I believe she said all she could see was the tail. Now, some of our viewers know these leopards so well. What? Oh, a slender mongoose. How's that? This is fantastic. These mongoose never sit still for us. Look at that. That is the most beautiful mongoose I think that we get out here. Oh. 
If you're a snake, you don't want to be tangling with the slender mongoose. They normally live in pairs, so there'll be another one around here somewhere. They've got that black tail, and they run with it up in the air like that. And I think it's because they want to try and avoid attack from above. I think they run with it up, and it possibly looks like a snake moving. I also think that it, it's the most obvious thing, and squirrels do it. Some of the other mongoose species do it. They don't have tails quite as long, and they don't live out in the open quite as long. But if you're a bird of prey coming down to swoop down to catch one of those things, the first thing you're going to grab onto is that tail. But the tail is obviously very easy to just drop out of the way. And I think that's why they carry their tails above their bodies like that. <laughs> I'm not sure where this comes from, but fuzzy koala bear, I will take it as an extreme compliment. You say that I am the Morgan Freeman of Africa. That's, um, that's, uh, that's, that's wonderful. Thank you very much. I'm not sure that Morgan Freeman would be too pr pleased to hear about that, but uh, thank you, fuzzy koala bear. I take that as an enormous compliment. Morgan Freeman is one of my favorite actors. <laughs> I don't know what to say to that. <clears throat> oh, Cindy, a lovely question from you about edible plants. And do we get vining plants like grapes, strawberries, and blackberries here? Not, not naturally. Oh, you didn't notice us, did you, Dyka? Just trotting off into the bush. I couldn't believe it. It stood dead still next to us. Why would it have not noticed us? What could it have been looking at? Let's just keep an eye out and see if there aren't the spots of a leopard's head looking out from underneath the shade of one of these bushes. No, I don't see anything on this stage. This is, this is exactly round about or parallel to where that female leopard was seen earlier today. OK, let's carry on. So, Cindy, you want to know about those climbing fruit plants. We don't have many indigenous uh, sort of climbing creeper things that you can eat here. No, a couple of berries that come out at various times of the year, but not, not in, in vines as far as I can remember. In fact, I don't think we have any. Certainly, obviously, I mean, not indigenously, but we have very famous wine-growing region in the south of the country called Stellenbosch, and, well, the whole of the Western Cape, basically. Stellenbosch and Paal and Frunchhoek and Elgin and various Agullis places like that make fantastic wines from grapes brought over originally by the French Huguenots in the 17th century. But other than that, not really. And I remember the, I was in England last year at the beginning of their winter, and I found it so amazingly pleasurable to be able to walk along the streets, or you know, the, the lanes, the farm lanes in Cornwall, and just pick berries off the, I think, what would they have been? It would have been blackberries. To pick blackberries off the side of the road and just eat them, it was very special indeed. Something is going on here. There is a kudu looking very alarmed. We're exactly opposite where that diker was now. There's a kudu in here. I'm just looking for tracks on the road, watching for the kudu, listening if the kudu doesn't make an alarm call, checking the top of the termite mound there, because Shadow does love to sit on a termite mound. There were two female kudu in here. Look, there, Brian, you can see them. Just their ears, maybe, through there. You see them?
Right, so we've got some technical gremlins creeping in, and uh, you back on the trail of this male leopard with me now that we've uh, we've left Karula to her nursing, and um, I'm once again following the trail that we where we lost the leopard tracks uh, this morning. We lost those male leopard tracks off to this side uh, in this block over here, and while we were busy searching for them again, we did hear some impala giving alarm calls in front of the car, probably three, four hundred yards in front of the car was where I'd guess those impala calls to be coming from. What's quite interesting is that on top of myself and James's footprints are wild dog tracks. So a portion of the pack or one of the packs or a different pack of wild dogs came through this area between morning game drive and now and there's been no sign of them since then and that is so typical of wild dog coming into an area basically bombshelling bombshelling it and uh, and then running through without anybody even seeing where they've gone to and um just to give you an idea of the size of area that they that they use a male leopard like the one we're looking for right now has a territory that is about 5,000 hectares big in the Saudi sands. 5,000 hectares is uh, a hectare is 100 yards by 100 yards, roughly. To give you an idea of 5,000 hectares, quite big. Um, a wild dog pack has an area roughly 10 times that size. Roughly 10 times that size. 450 to 600 square kilometers. Which is massive uh, to give you an idea and they run through that territory zigzag across it go from one side to another they really do comb that territory true endurance predators now we're coming up to cheetah cut line again one of our cut lines the cut line on our eastern boundary And it's a nice, very nice sandy road. So it's actually quite easy to see tracks on it. If nothing, if nothing has obliterated the tracks, there's a water buck on the side of the road for us, some impala here. Um, but it also is a boundary road and the leopard was busy moving towards this boundary road. So it's a good place to see if he's crossed because then it means that we're either wasting our time. And if it hasn't crossed, then we know we're on a worthwhile endeavor. But, Looking at this antelope, Darlene in Hampshire. Good afternoon, Darlene. Has asked a nice question. Do we get Thompson's gazelle here? And she's read somewhere that they like to pronk. What is pronking? And do our antelope or do our gazelle pronk? Um, so, Darlene, you've got quite a lot of questions in that little statement. Uh, so, let me just start with the first one. Uh, we don't get Thompson's gazelle here where we are. Um, the closest thing that we get to a Thompson's gazelle is a springbuck, but springbuck don't occur in the Kruger National Park in this area. Springbuck start occurring on top of the inland plateau, um, not too far away from where we are. Um, but that's about the South African version of a, of a, of a Thompson's gazelle, is a springbuck. And now to the second part of your question. You've seen animals prunk, and do our animals do it? And with the exception of the one that we're looking at at the moment, yes, they do stot, they don't pronk. The pronk that you were looking at was referring to a very stiff four-legged jump that only the springbuck do, as far as I know. The stot or that funny um, gait, that rocking from the front feet to the hind feet gait that you're referring to is called a stot, and that a lot of animals will do. Um, we see a, lo a lot of times in the impala out here, kudu will also do a stot, and it is one of the most bizarre things you've ever seen in your life. It's like um, you definitely have to go and research if you, if you are wondering what this is. Go and YouTube a video of stotting, and you'll see what I'm talking about. But basically what it is, it is a show of strength and fitness. 
and it absolutely has an impact on predators' decision to hunt any particular animals. Animals are less likely to to be caught by a leopard or targeted by a cheetah or a wild dog or lion if they're the ones that are busy stutting or pronking. Um, animals that don't do that are targeted. And that's because uh, predators are keyed to taking out the sick, lame, and lazy um, animals. And if an animal cannot pronk or stut, it becomes immediately a focus. What's wrong with that animal? Can I hunt it? Is it going to be slower than the rest? Ooh. I'm being assailed by my nemesis out here, and that's the flies. Um, so why we stopped for so long and listening to, uh, well, answering the question about pronking and stutting, um, it's also given us an opportunity to just listen to the bush and watch that, that water buck. That was a female water buck that you were having a look at. She's now come out from underneath the tree. And you can see that very characteristic shaggy coat with the white ring on her bottom. North America, the mule deer looks almost the same. One of the larger antelope that we found out here, they get to probably around 400 pounds, uh, with a big male going up to 500, maybe 550 pounds. So fairly large antelope, very common in the Sabi sands. Grass eating, And we've got a, a question all the way out of Switzerland from Steph, who's asked, what's the difference between a gazelle and an antelope? Um, Steph, that's a good question. Uh, without me pulling out my book right now to be able to answer it for you, I'm just going to say that the two are, are collective names for groups of animals that share common characteristics or common traits. The antelope will all share co probably a common body structure and a fairly similar... Um, digestion probably, maybe geographical area, and the antelope will be exactly the same. They will follow, a, 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 they will be grouped to a group of animals. So the gazelles and the antelopes are collective nouns for groups of animals that almost look the same um, and probably occur in different areas. Um, if that answers your question, to without me having to pull out a book out now, I'll be able to give you an Oxford Dictionary title but potentially what you could do is uh, is you could research it and let us know and I'll share it with everybody everybody else that's watching not forgetting that this show is interactive um, and you can send your answers through to us at uh, questions at wildearth.tv via email or on the Twitter handle uh, hashtag safari live and um, I'll share it with you so the definition as word perfect as we can get it um, for now I'm just waving at a passing, a passing Land Rover from Aubrey, he's one of our teammates. And we are going to carry on going, see if we can see anything else. Virginia Beach has asked if, uh, if animals that encounter the smell of a predator turn around and walk in the opposite direction. Uh, yes, I have seen that happen. I've seen it happen with honey badger. I've seen it happen with uh, elephant. I've seen it happen with rhino and buffalo. But it's not consistent. Sometimes it happens with, with them on fresh tracks or dung or a scent mark. Other times it happens with a scent carried on the breeze. It's definitely not consistent. Um, and I'm actually not too sure why animals do react to, uh, to scent markings. Like I said, it's, sometimes you see it and sometimes you don't. And it's an enigma still to myself as to, as to exactly why. Um, but yes, in a nutshell, they do react, just not always. All right, now back to the endless searching for a spotty cat. Um, we are almost where I thought we heard those impala calling. And in actual fact, as I just said that, there was some impala crossing the road in front of us at the exact place where I expected there to be some or other sign of this leopard. If he carried on in the same trajectory or vector, it's probably the better word to use. Um, when leopard 
quite often do that. Leopard walk in vectors. They'll walk for a certain amount of time or distance on exactly the same berry. And then they sleep or they have a snooze or they have a hunt and they will move off in a direction uh, from that or radial to that. Uh, and they carry on walking in that direction for straight lines. And they do that across their territory, doing these funny straight line marches from place to place. And it does make predicting where they're going to be a little bit easier. Not much, because they're still very difficult animals to find. But definitely a little bit easier. Now, I'm going to pull off the road over here to let Aubrey pass, because I guarantee you that he is definitely not wanting to follow me ambling along at a snail's pace down this road. asked if there's any chance of seeing a cheetah and good afternoon first Michelle and secondly yes there's absolutely every chance of seeing a cheetah whether that'll happen today or next month or next year is the is the money question um, two reasons for that one is cheetah solitary which makes them almost as difficult to find as leopard uh, and two there are very few cheetah in the Kruger National Park it's a critically endangered species of animal uh, there are only about 150 to 200 cheetah um, in the Kruger National Park, which is 35,000 square kilometers big. Um, so you can imagine it's definitely like finding a nail in a haystack. Um, but what we are looking at is the cheetah's favorite food. And if there's one place that you would stand the best chance out of all others is hanging around where the food is. You hang around where the food is and you will absolutely see every predator that the Kruger National Park can cough up and which eats that animal at that at any time. I have no doubt that this is the herd of impala that we that we heard barking this morning. They give a very characteristic snorting alarm call and that is what we were hearing this morning. It's coming from exactly the area that I thought they were coming from. Um, impala herds, they move from thick bush to open areas at night time. They spend the night on an open area and then depending on a, a vote, I suppose, in the morning, they will choose where around that open area they'll go to feed uh, on the grass and on the, on the leaves and twigs around that area. They also make their way to water. Impala were thought to be water dependent um, and it's proven that they're not that water dependent, they're actually quite hardy animals. They don't really need much water. But in a dry year like this, I think, because of the lack of a lot of moisture in the leaves and the grass that they're eating, you probably find that these impala are moving to and from the closest water to here every day. Um, the closest water to here is at Chitwa Chitwa, which is probably three or four hundred yards in this direction and the dam is probably another three or four hundred yards away from that. So they're not too far away from water at all. All right, let's carry on going. Heidi all the way from North Carolina and firstly thank you very much for the nice compliment. Um, Heidi was saying to me over the radio that um, she enjoys listening to all the information I have to give them. I'm sure, thanks Heidi, I'm sure it's the same for all the other presenters, they're all clever in their own right. Um, but yes, um, now I've completely forgotten the question that you were going to ask me and that's just due to my age, too much sun shining on my head and my very poor memory for things like that. So I'm going to have to ask Jerry just to repeat it so that I can answer you. Ah yes, secondary baby impalas. So impala do have a, a, 
a trait that in good years and in most years in actual fact, um, some impala will not come into estrus in the rut. They will come into estrus slightly after that, a month or two after. And these are called secondary baby. Excuse me, the births as a result of this are called secondary births or secondary babies. And in that particular nursery herd, there were none. But yes, I have seen I have seen some this year, not not a lot to be honest, there's not too many, I would say probably a handful, five to six uh, in every herd at most. Um, and I have seen that herd on um, the sandy patch has a couple of second, secondary babies and the herd that is on open area quarantine have a couple of secondary babies. So yes, but not in that herd that we just saw now. Oh, back to this quest. You can have a look at the sunlight coming through the clouds over there. It's actually quite a nice view. You can now see the clouds that have crept in over the course of the afternoon. Sunlight streaming through those clouds. Not very thick and lying very high. So not likely to bring rain at all, not unless the pressure starts dropping and more moisture starts coming in. But it is nice and a welcome break from the heat of today. Today was quite a warm day. Nice breeze that's been blowing, but still quite a warm day. Here we go, some lovely ray of sunshine coming through the gap in the cloud there. Isn't that fantastic? Now, while myself and Andrew listen to the bush here. We're going to take some time off to listen to the bush and I'm going to need to take this earpiece out of my ear. Um, I have absolutely noticed that it, it absolutely halves the ability to listen to the bush around me and that is my primary weapon out here or my primary observation tool. So we are going to be crossing through to James and um, we're going to carry on listening to the bush. Right, everybody, sorry about our loss of contact the other time. It's a function of the cable here and the roughness of this road. We're going to get off this road now. We've checked thoroughly. I can't see any tracks of shadow. I suspect she's headed off into the west around one eye pan, probably went there to have a bit of a drink earlier this afternoon. And so we're going to head out of the area away from this rough road with its fairly unsightly power lines. That is just the way of things. We do need power, of course, in here. Power to send signal to where you happen to be, wherever you are in the world. Anyway, this is where we were. The Kudu couldn't find out what they were looking for. I think that they were actually looking at the Daika. We then managed to see the Daika across here, and I think that's what those Kudu were looking at. If it had been a predator, I suspect they probably would have been alarm calling as opposed to just going, which is what they were doing. But we're still going to drive past slowly. This is where we were when you lost us last. Checking the trees for the dangling limbs of a stern book. There's the duck. There's a diker, everybody. A grey diker or common diker. They're better known as a common diker here because they're not very grey, are they? They're more brown, but they're very grey towards the Cape. Now, Tony, while we hope that, that diker doesn't run off, you want to know if a berry or a plant is safe for a baboon to eat or a monkey because they're primates, are they safe for us to eat? No, definitely not, Tony. Monkeys and baboons are far better adapted to living in this area than we are. They eat a lot in the way of leaves, which will provide the fiber. They eat a lot of insects, which I suppose we could eat if we were truly desperate. But I suspect that their stomachs are far better adapted to dealing with some of the toxins that occur in this area. So I wouldn't go around eating something just because a baboon ate it. I definitely wouldn't. And there are certainly, I mean, there's some plants out here that some herbivores can cope with and some can't because they're toxic. So you need special adaptations. That said, if you lived in this area, I'm sure you could get used to things that would otherwise be toxic to people who were used to a kind of traditional Western diet. 
And I mean, if you have only to go to an exotic place in the world to know that people eat different things there and their stomachs cope with different things. If you go to China, you might eat a cricket. Uh, if you went to, if you came here, you might eat a mapani worm or a termite. Just a bit of alarm calling going on there. And your stomach would cope with them, but certainly I think you'd feel probably a little bit ill for the first little while. But Tony, no, I certainly wouldn't take the eating. Uh, I mean, if you saw a baboon eating something, then yes, you might think, okay, that's a first step. If I'm on a survival course, maybe I would think about eating it. But yeah, I don't know. I mean, they will happily eat completely raw meat. Sometimes they eat, they don't eat rotten meat, but I would be nervous of eating everything that they did. Good question. That's actually a really clever question. Thank you, Tony. I don't want to stray too far from this area simply because I'm hoping the dogs are going to come back at some stage this evening. They are still on Buffalo's Hook as far as I understand it, so they're not coming anytime soon. Anyway, what we're going to do is go down and check Impala Road, which is the road that runs parallel with the Triple M break, if you like, or the, that main road that we were on, and we'll see if we don't pick up any tracks of shadow there or indeed anything else. Perhaps those elephants we had. And we, this is the major kind of thoroughfare for animals moving off towards Sydney's dam to have a drink. Drive a little bit faster while we get there. Hello, Pamela on Twitter. I wish I truly knew the answer to your question. You want to know how is it that some days we see giraffe and elephant and all sorts, and some days we see absolutely nothing. Uh, where do they all go? Well, the answer, Pamela, is that they, they go into the bush. And sometimes they're on Juma and sometimes they aren't. But you can imagine if we were driving along this road, for example, and if, Brian, if you don't mind putting the camera into this block here, if you were an impala or a zebra or a kudu or a wildebeest or a buffalo or even an elephant, if you were more than 30 or 40 meters, so up to 150 feet off the road, you would be completely invisible. And there's no way of us knowing that you were in there. So even a giraffe in a thick bush like that will be difficult to see. The other thing, of course, Pamela, is that this particular reserve is not very large, and animals do move quite big distances, especially when there is a drought on and they've got to move a long way to water and then away from the water again to find something to eat. It's not surprising to me that some days we catch animals here and some days we don't. Of course, the predators are always secretive. We do track them quite a lot. I know that the Nkuhuma Pride was found this morning just inside Torchwood on the Gauri main road, so between Cheetah Plains and Torchwood. All five of them back together, which is quite exciting. No junior. I think he's finally been thrown out of home. So they're all fine and looking after themselves. But, you know, they're just not on Juma at the moment. And I mean, if you take the example of where we walked this morning, so Steph and Andrew and I walked this morning, we took the bush walk, and we probably walked about maybe four or five kilometers, but we did a bit of a loop around. Now, if you walk four or five kilometers in a straight line, just about anywhere on this property, you're gonna go off it. And, you know, animals were walking much further distances in a drought like this to try and find food. So I think that's pretty much why it's sometimes we get a great plethora of an animals here and sometimes we don't. Right, we're going to head down this road called Impala Road, hopefully find some further tracks of shadow. Brian, remember, we've just discovered a new kind of cloud. You see that? That's called a politician cloud cloud, everybody. A political cloud. Promises much, delivers nothing. Particularly relevant in this country at the moment. But beautiful nevertheless. They're much more beautiful than any of our politicians. In fact, I 
hesitate to say, much more beautiful than any politician I've ever seen. It's certainly not as beautiful as that, Brian. Staring at us beautifully, framed by the gray cloud, a lilac-breasted roller. So named for its lilac breast, obviously, and its rolling habit flies up into the air when doing a display and flips about like a piper cub on maneuvers. Isn't that beautiful? There is the distant rumbling of thunder. Somewhat like the distant rumbling of the State of the Nation address that we're going to be forced to listen to next week. Oh, they tell me there are seven colors on a lilac-breasted roller. I'll keep unplugging myself. This is deeply frustrating. Sorry, Jerry. And I don't know how many colors are on a lilac-breasted roller. I've never taken the time to count it. Let's see if we can. It's sitting so beautifully. We've got the light, to light stuff on the belly, the lilac on the breast, the white on the throat, that orangey color around the ears, the bright blue on the back, the purplish on the back of the head. I've got six so far. And black. There, I've got seven. Wonderful. Seven colors on the lilac-breasted roller. Common bird, common magnificent bird. Righty, on we go. Jerry's not speaking to us, is she, at the moment, Brian? No. Okay. Watch the roller. He might do a roll. No, he's gone. Nasty fellow. Right, so we're now on Impala Road, and the road that we were on just now, the triple limb break between some Bambili and here, is just only about 100 meters that way. So we're going to drive very slowly down here, keeping an eye out. Sorry, Jerry, try again. My box isn't working so well. Really? Is she talking? Sorry, everyone. This is deeply, deeply embarrassing. Oh, dear. This is a complete waste of time. Hold on one second. One in there. Right. One in there. Right, try again, Gerald. I think I've got you now. There we go, I got you, Jerry. Okay, cool. <laughs> Hello, Valerie in Massachusetts. You want to know if I think that there's, it's perhaps time for another rain dance with Brian. Um, Brian, given the success of our last one, probably not, hey? Oh, we should no. retire while we were here. Yes, or behind given that we uh, failed to precipitate any rain last time. No, we did. It came later in the evening. It did come later in the evening. That's actually very true, yes. Uh, Valerie, perhaps not this evening. Let's try and find something worthwhile. If we don't find any decent game, we'll certainly think about it. I would very much like to see Shadow. I haven't seen her for a while. Rumors of her pregnancy abound. At the moment, I think she has gone back into Arethusa or Simbambili. Hello, Ruth in Costa Rica, a place I would very much like to visit one day. You want to know, we were chatting about primates earlier with Tony in Holland, and you want to know why we don't see more in the way of primates, or baboons especially. Ruth, baboons like very large trees to roost in, and the very large trees that they like to roost in are normally up around the, or down on the riverbeds. So the big fig trees and jackalberry, ebony's, a couple of Scotia trees that they like to roost in. 
I have seen a few troops of baboons here, but not many. And we don't have those enormous trees like you do on the, Sa on the Saabi or the Sand River, which are the two major rivers of the Saabi Sands, unsurprisingly. And, in fact, let me go down that other road. And Ruth, you want to know if they're dangerous to the drives. No, they're absolutely not. Don't pose any danger at all. They are not quite the same as the Cape baboon. Well, they're exactly the same species, but they don't, they don't uh, come anywhere near us. They won't approach a human being. In Cape Town, of course, if you go anywhere near a baboon, it will take your lunch from you. And that's because, um, not to put too fine a point on it, idiots have fed those baboons for years. They continue to feed the baboons despite being told not to. And so over the years, the baboons have totally lost their fear, fear of human beings. And it's never ceased to amaze me how whatever, you know, you go to these lodges all over the place and everywhere there are signs that say, don't feed the monkeys, don't feed the baboons. And without fail, you will find somebody who thinks that a monkey or a baboon is just too cute not to try and feed. And suddenly they find themselves with two nasty fang marks in the hand. Anyway, that's not to say that it happens to everyone, but it does happen. The reason animals lose their fear of human beings is because we are generally quite silly around them, and that's why it happens. Right, Steph has got something decent to show you. Other than political clouds, we're going to keep looking for shadows, tracks, and I'll see you shortly. Here we have a rare visitor and one for uh, for those bird bird lists that uh, that you've uh, been building over the last couple of weeks. Um, for, so, firstly, let's have a look at the facts here. The observation is that it has it's a fairly large bird, and it's sitting on top of a tree, and it's got a tail streamer, and it's got a sharp, curved beak, and it is slightly mauve in colour with a black eye stripe. And that should be enough from the, just the general impression of size and shape and those other small little things to say that this is a carmine bee eater. And why I say this is a, not a rare, it's just a, a, not a rare visitor, but it definitely is a visitor that doesn't stay a long, uh, here for a long time is that they come from Botswana and Zambia. They spend most of the year here. And then between Christmas and around about the 1st of March, they come and visit here for the, for the insect loads. I'm not too sure what makes them leave Zambia and Botswana. Um, a lot of the bee eaters are migratory. There's another one there that is sitting in profile a little bit better. Sorry, Andrew, I didn't mean to hijack your shot there. I just wanted to... Here's one, that's the very characteristic feature. The carmine bee eaters. Small flocks, and they, like most of the bee eaters, they dig holes in banks at rivers to nest in. They use their beak and they use their feet to excavate these holes. And they lay a couple of eggs inside there, and they their holes are spaced probably about a hand apart from one another, and they literally pepper banks. And I've sat in clouds of carmine bee eaters, hundreds of pairs strong. It's one of the most spectacular sights that you could treat yourself to, and I highly recommend doing that. A good place to see them is the um, South Luangwa National Park and Shakawi in Botswana is another good place to see them, just as the Kavango River debauches itself into the Okavango Delta. There's another good place to see clouds of these beaters. Now, the beaters shape that sharp curved bill gives them the unique ability to feed on a group of insects that other animals or other birds don't really feed on, and that is the Hymenoptera, or the bees and wasps. And the reason for that is that most birds have a wide gape, like a swallow, for instance, and a bee will be coming along, and the swallow would open up the gape and swallow the insect. If you did that to a bee or a wasp, the bee would sting you on the inside of your mouth, you'd swell up and you'd die. The bee eaters 
have evolved this long, sharp, curved beak. They hawk insects, so they come and they hawk an insect in their beak, keeping the sting away from their face. They then go to a branch and they wipe the sting off of that bee or wasp and then swallow it, minus the sting, which is a very, very awesome way of getting over one of these adaptations that insects have evolved to stop being preyed upon. And they, apart from insects catching insects, um, the bee eaters are unique to catching the hymenoptera or the bees and wasps. And the size difference from the little bee eater, which is about this size, to the larger carmine bee eater, which I'll show you now in my book, is so that they can feed on different sizes of bees and wasps. The carmine bee eaters are to feed on the largest members of the bees and wasps, whereas the little bee eaters are feeding on if you'd excuse me for one second while I find this, it won't take me very long. While you're having another... Hello everybody, sorry about Steph going black screen. I'm surprised on the jigger that that's happened. I'm not sure in what region he finds himself now. We have come onto Balanites Road and found uh, as much as we found for the rest of the drive. Nothing. My audio is very low. Ah. Jerry, we've run out of batteries. Don't worry, we'll change them live. Sorry about that, everyone. Batteries have run out. It happens, of course. There we go. Well done, Jerry. Push on the back. Oh, I'm trying, Brian. I'm trying. Oh, no, don't mix them up. Very good point. Right, positive in there. Positive in there. Push it in the side. Jerry, how's that? Jerry? Jerry? Oh, good. Right, there we go. Phew. Right. So, as I was saying, we were driving along here, finding nothing. But the interesting thing here, to me, is just how every time I come along this road, so the vegetation decreases further. And the trees are sparse compared with how they are normally this time of the year. And if you want to do some bush clearing, of course, this is probably a good time to do it. Bring in the elephants, they will eat the trees and clear things out of it. Steph and I were walking, and Brian were walking through a, a thicket yesterday morning that used to be totally impenetrable. It would have been impossible about a month ago to walk through there with the walking backpack on it. And now it's just decimated. All of the knobthorn trees have been pushed over. And they're the one tree species that really copes very poorly with elephants. They get pushed over and they die. You take their bark off and they die. Most of the other trees out here, if you push them over, they just start growing in an opposite direction. And this whole area was kind of decimated. Oh, hello, little steel box. Stop running away. Got him there, Brian. I go back a little. There's a Steenbock, everyone. We must take what we can get these days. Oh, even if they don't want us. So, what have we had today, Brian? We've had elephants to start with that didn't want anything to do with us. We had a squirrel. The squirrel was pretty good, yes. We had some zebras in the far distance. Dyker and frightened Stiernbuk. Marvellous, very exciting. Well, we're going to continue along our way here, hoping for tracks of a leopard, perhaps. And I just don't want to go too far from here in case those dogs come back. But I may be forced to head off towards where we had those male leopard tracks this morning. That was wonderful to try and follow this morning. I think Mvula certainly in Vula's territory, up around the Biffleshook Dam. Ah, 
Ah, it's a very, very good point. James Taylor makes a good point about honey and its antihistamine properties. Brian, have you tried any honey? No, no you see. Right, we'll feed him up with honey this evening, James, and see that he feels better in the morning. Jamie's also been struggling, so it's something in the air. I've also got a bit of a clogged up sinus. So I suspect it's probably just dust. Lack of rain, dust in the air. Steph and I, after our run today, at least after our walk today, went for a run. We came running along this road, and within four meters, we would, came round this corner, and of course, when you're running, you've got to really concentrate hard because if you're getting tired, uh, you tend to look at your feet. And that's normally when something steps out of the bush, which is precisely what happened as we came around the corner here and there was a buffalo bull watching us intently like this. He was very surprised to see us coming. So then we thought we'd pass the buffalo and then those same elephants that we saw when we went live, they were standing at the opposite end of the road. None of them paid us any mind at all. They just kind of pressed on. There was very fresh tracks of a puff adder going across the road. That would be special to see. Oh, I would be so excited to see a puff adder. Regardless, I'll show you the tracks. Except I've run them over. Well, they're there now. We can probably get a look. Now, I'll tell you how I know it was a puff adder. I'm getting out of the car, Jerry. You won't be able to talk to me. Now, here you can see uh, it's not a puff adder at all. Okay, can you see this kind of flattened thing that goes across the road here? And into the bush there. I have driven over it, obviously, once. And our puff adder moves with what we call reticulated motion. So it moves in a straight line. It doesn't sort of curve and slither like a normal snake. It can do that if it wants to, but normally it just kind of moves along its ribs, moving like a millipede's legs, and that's how it moves. But this is not a snake. And the reason I know that, and you won't, probably won't be able to see it from there, is that there are feet marks here. You can see them. So it was, in fact, probably a very large monitor lizard, a tree or rock monitor. They are the same species, and that's what went walking across the road here, going that way, probably into this tree. He's probably got a nest there, or perhaps further along even. Right. Let's continue. So I think what we're going to do, everyone, is we're going to go up to Buffleshook Dam, at least to Sydney's Dam again. Just check that those other elephants haven't popped out somewhere near there. We'll go via, we'll go via Gallagher Shortcut and pass the Gallagher Waterhole at the same on our way. And then we're going to head off to the east and see if we can't just maybe pick up some lucky tracks from the male leopard that we were following earlier. And we'll keep an ear out on the radio for anything from the wild dogs. That is going to be our plan from now. We'll hopefully find something along the way. We've had two extremely quiet drives now. Right, while we're looking for something, let's go across to Steph and see what he's got. Welcome back to the leopard track or the tracking exercise myself and Andrew are involved in. Um, we're just busy snaking our way through the bush here and really just trying to pick up on any sign or track of, uh, of this male leopard. I haven't seen a single thing from when we last left you. And uh, we had to leave that area where we were showing you the calm I beat. It was, a, it was quite low right in the Milwati drainage line, a lot of big trees around. And uh, it wasn't doing our signal any good. So we left there. We are now very close to Cheetah Cut Line again. And we are just busy doing parallel roads, basically, through this area. And this is one of the prettier of the view sites. 
actually see, I'm going to show you something now. It's raining over Acorn Hook. And this year, for some reason, Acorn Hook has got the most amount of rain of the area. Every time it rains here, Acorn Hook gets the lion's share. Now, basically, where this branch is pointing from this tree is a mountain. And you can see the mountain is shadowed by that deluge that's happening over there. That's what we call a cloudburst here in, in Africa. There's the edge of it on the one side, the mountain coming out. And there is the mountain on the other side. So quite a localized thunder shower right at that, at the rain is a, is a village called Acorn Hook. And it seems to get the lion's share of the rain at the moment. It really does. Now coming up on the right out of the screen there is Maripskop. That's the tallest peak of the Drakensberg in this particular area. It's not the tallest peak in the Drakensberg. That belongs to Montesources. But it is a very high peak. And uh, basically our version of Table Mountain, the Hoodspread version of Table Mountain, and it's home to about 2,000 different species of plant, which I found out the other day was absolutely incredible, considering where we are now within sight of that mountain has about a quarter of that only. And that's mainly because we sit in the rain shadow of the Lebombos, and we don't get a lot of rain. Um, we do get a fair amount, but not nearly as much as what they get on that escarpment. That is a plateau. It's the edge of a plateau. It's 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 called an escarpment. Um, above it, it just gets higher and higher. It's not a mountain range that has a low point on the other side. That goes up and then just gets higher. Right here, we're sitting at about 400 meters or 400 yards above sea level, roughly. Uh, up there, where Johannesburg is, sits at 1,800 meters, so a mile uh, up in the sky. And they also get a lot more rain than what we do out here. Clouds are pulling in. They're definitely not getting thicker or lower. And I actually don't think that they are covering more of the sky. They seem to be moving, but they're burning off as they're coming overhead, which is characteristic of this area. All bark and no bite is what the saying goes, isn't it? And we're sitting here with dust on our palms and gritty eyeballs and basically drying ourselves out by the second out here. Um, I love it though, to be quite honest with you. I don't like getting cold whatsoever. So for me, sunlight and heat and summer are it. That's what I like. I don't enjoy cold weather at all. <laughs> well, there is a water bug standing under the tree. While we're looking at this water buck busy chewing her cud, Kiki, who's only nine years old, has just said to me that she's missed school today because it was, there was too much snow. And uh, do school kids in South Africa miss school? Kiki, wow, what a good question, you know. Yes, I have missed school because of flooding once in my life, and that was only because a massive tree was blown over my driveway. Um, our schools are not closed here because of, um, of weather. We don't have a lot of snow in this country. We don't have a lot of rain. We don't have a lot of tornadoes or any natural event. We don't have volcanoes, earthquakes, hurricanes, none of that sort of thing. So we're blessed in that. Now we've got a very temperate climate. It doesn't get too cold in winter. Uh, to be honest with you, um, I have touched snow only once in my life and I actually can't remember it. It was so young, I've only actually seen a photograph of me touching some snow. I can't remember the actual event. <laughs> so that was the last time I touched snow. Um, and although I have lived through a flood in the year 2000 in this area, um, it wasn't, it was bad, property was lost. I ended up waking up with my room in the water with just a few inches short of where I was lying on my bed. But it wasn't, that was once in all my years out here. So no is my answer to your question in a nutshell there, Kiki. School is not missed because of snow or any other weather effect here. 
Now that water bucket's probably been in that area underneath that tree. It's on the eastern side of the tree, so it would have been in the shade for the day. And I have seen so many antelope this year, more so than I've ever remembered seeing before, standing with their head on the eastern side of a tree this time of the afternoon with their head right next to the, the bark. I've seen impala do it, I've seen waterbuck do it, I've seen kudu doing it, and they do it because that's the deepest shade during the heat of the day. And there's so many trees without leaves or at least with sparse leaf cover and with sparse grass cover, they need to get out of the sun to avoid exposure and heat stroke. And especially when you're covered in a mass of hair like that waterbuck is, um, you definitely need to keep yourself cool. All right. So we're going to carry on going. We're going to carry on going down with this road. While I've been stopping here, I've been listening to the bush all around us. And there's definitely no sign that I can hear of any disturbance of this leopard. So he's either out of this area or hasn't gotten moving just yet from wherever he's decided to lie up during the heat of the day. So we're going to carry on going, stopping periodically to listen to the bush around us. And hopefully before the end of the show, we can actually show you, show you this Tom we're investing so much energy into. <laughs> a slight problem with my radio it seems to have gone deathly silent in my ear which for one is fantastic but for two does usually signi uh, uh, signify a problem all right there we go jerry's back i can hear you again seems like we just needed to get over it up James Richard on Twitter has just asked me a question I've never had before. Um, does the does the waterbuck coat repel a tsetse fly? Um, what a good question. I know that the the skin of a waterbuck is filled with sebaceous glands that exude a lot of oil. That then goes onto the fur of the waterbuck and is water repellent, highly water repellent. It also has a funny smell. Um, the gland itself has a funny smell, or at least by the time it gets onto the fur and stays there for a while, it has a funny smell. As to will it repel the tsetse fly, the, the, um, the hair or the fur on a waterbuck is very thick and I think that would help. Um, it's also quite difficult to get through and get under because of this oil. Um, as to whether or not the oil would repel a fly, I'm not too sure. I don't think so. I've never read anything about it. As to the combination of fur and oil and thickness, potentially, yes. So good question. I'd say definitely better than me, for instance. I don't repel tsetse flies at all. Um, so absolutely uh, plausible. Last question. Good. If the brain juice is flowing. Now we've come into a part of the reserve that's just been hammered by elephant. Um, you have these areas that from time to time do look like they get elephant attention more so than others. And you'll notice that around me while we're busy driving, you'll see a fair amount of trees that are just pushed over. And elephants definitely are one of those animals that terraform change the habitat that they live in quite substantially. And it is a sense of, well, it is the cause of huge debate as to whether or not it's beneficial or not. Uh, it's the debate that's been raging for absolute years as to whether or not they know what they're doing, whether or not we're seeing a natural cycle of things. Don't forget that there is no way that we reach a climax point in Africa. It's all is a, it's a dynamic equilibrium. Things are constantly changing. There's no goal post or goal point or end point to reach. Um, and so it doesn't regress and then 
get better, regress and get better. It always just carries on. Um, so we don't really know whether or not what we're seeing is just this particular process carrying on with elephants in the bush around them, um, or whether it truly is too many elephants. You know? We don't really know, or at least I don't. answer the question that I pitched uh, to everyone a little bit earlier on gazelles and antelope. Um, and I'm going to see if I can recite this. Once again, my, my very holy memory banks may need to be uh, updated, but all gazelles are antelope. Not all antelope are gazelles is as far as I get it. And um, I just have to say thank you for that. Now, obviously, if all gazelles are antelope, that would mean that gazelles are a genus or, or a, a couple of genuses of antelope. And they would share certain characteristics with one another, one of them being the fact that they are part of the Bovidae family. So there's a whole bunch of terminology inside there to keep you busy flying your fingers over the keyboard, I'm sure, to find out exactly what I'm talking about. But nonetheless, I just have to say thank you very, very much for that contribution. It's always nice to share knowledge with one another, and I'll be the first one to say that I need to learn as much as with you, or I, my thirst for knowledge is as much as your thirst for knowledge, and I really enjoy sharing everyone's access to knowledge and interests on the show. Don't forget, you can comment on what you see. You don't have to always ask me questions. You can just make a comment, and uh, we can chat about it as well. We can even pick a theme for the day, or if you just want to pick something that interests you, you're welcome. I'll discuss it in as much detail as I'm able to, and with my reference books piled next to me. Andrew will try and show you. That is a box of books. You can see what I carry around there with me. <laughs> Many, including my insect bible. <laughs> so, I am able to answer some questions, ones that I don't know. Right, now we're coming back out onto, um, onto Cheetah Cutline. Uh, not onto Cheetah Cutline, onto um, Gary Main, and then we'll be going back up to Cheetah Cutline again. And this time I think Andrew's going to be ready to murder me from all the repetition of it. has just commented on me using names for places like Biffle's Hook Dam and Acorn Hook. What does hook mean? Hook, uh, literally translated from Afrikaans, um, is corner. So it would be Acorn Corner and Biffle or Buffalo Corner. That is the translation of the word hook. I hope that helps. So Acorn Hook and Buffalo's Hook are names of places probably given to the name of the portion of land as it was described on the original prospector's chart out here. A lot of the, the, the names of places out here are given as reference to the name of the farm or a name of the portion of land as it was described on its prospectus chart or the chart that was handed in or designed. I don't know how they do it when land surveyors come out here, cut up land into portions and allocated a code or a farm at least a code. Very interesting for me when you look back at old charts about settlers in an area because it's very different, obviously, for very different people. The African people had their areas and their names for places and their farms, for lack of a better word, and when the white settlers came into this area, it was exactly the same. They cut the place up again and named it a whole bunch of different things, and that sparked off a whole bunch of wars and a whole bunch of nasty things that, uh, 
that followed, as I'm sure it would have done in almost every country on earth to some degree or another. Um, but once you go back and once the nastiness is over and you can go back and have a look at these things in history, it always interests me, like Lion Kill Stream and Buffalo Corner and Acorn Corner, where do these things come from? Like, who was the person who had the experience in that place? Why did he decide to name that particular place that it's, I, uh, I, I fantasize about that uh, daydreaming, obviously not while I'm on air. Andrew is daydreaming and I'm daydreaming around here. James has got a very strange looking antelope to show you. So we were just driving down the road here and we saw two adults, Kudu, just behind us. And we thought, well, we've kind of seen them, so we'll carry on. And then just down the road, I think the other two were going for a drink at the Gallagher waterhole. And there we found, or here we found, a little Kudu calf. Now you can see it lying down in the grass with its ears kind of slightly flattened, but ears almost adult sized already, trying desperately to figure out if we can see it or not. There's another one just to the right of that one. And I think those two kudu cows have left their youngsters here so that they can go and have a drink. Now what's very interesting to me about this is that this is what animals that can move to water will do. They leave their calves cover in cover like this. I mean, these are not particularly well covered but they leave them in an area like this, away from the water, because they know that predators, if they're looking to hunt at this time of the day, will hang around water. Certainly we've seen around that Gallagher waterhole plenty in the way of lions and leopards in the last little while. And so they don't want to take these young kudu towards there. The kudu, of course, the youngsters like this, do not need to drink water. They'll get all of their moisture from the milk that they're drinking. So that's why this little one is here just wondering where its friend's gone. And it's the same with sable, earlunt, roan antelope, I think probably hartebeers and sesebe as well. They leave their youngsters away from the water. And so the advent of artificial water points all over the Kruger Park and the Sabi Sands and places like that has meant that the ability or the space available for animals like this to leave their calves away from water is obviously much less. And you can see the little horns. Can you see the horns starting to erupt on one, both sides of the head there? So there's a young male. Little, little kudu trotting off. Oh, so nervous. Okay, let's leave them. They're a bit nervous. Isn't that lovely? Fascinating to see. I don't want to frighten them too much, so let's just quickly get past them. They're obviously quite scared. That was really cool. You don't see that very often. And people often ask, well, I mean, sometimes I have been asked, where are the kudu youngsters? All right, so we're heading up Gallagher, Gallagher Shortcut at the moment, trying to just go and see if there's any action happening at Sydney's Dam. I'm going to get an update on the radio about those dogs as soon as we get there, and then we're going to head off towards the east. But there just doesn't seem to be a great deal happening out here at the moment. We need Jamie to come and find us all the animals again. Anyway, we'll see what happens. This is the area where the old hyena den used to be, or the, um, the Gallagher shortcut hyena den. And Andrew went there, I think it was yesterday evening, and he said that it's really stank. And I find that amazing. I mean, the new one really stank. And I don't really understand that because the, the old hyena den, I, I've never been to a hyena den that really smells bad. And so I'm really interested that, that, that it did smell. And I've always been surprised at how little they smell and how normally they smell of nothing at all. So I don't know if they're going to attract extra attention by having a smelly home but that certainly might mean that they're about to move out of that den and go to another one. Right, we're coming up onto the northern side now of the reserve, back towards the dam. The clouds are building and we're hearing quite a lot of thunder. I saw some lightning. 
So maybe we'll get something of a rain, but you know, it always starts like this and then it kind of dissipates. There's a huge bird there, Brian. You see it there? In the, there. Flying away, naturally. <laughs> Flying away behind a tree. I think it's actually landed in that tree there. There, massive bird. Let's just try and get into a position where we can see it. Not really. It's it's in that sort of. There's a tree around there. It's in there, but it seemed to come up off the ground. I wonder if it wasn't on this termite mound. Maybe eating termites. Maybe a step eagle eating termites. They will certainly be looking to capitalize on any termite eating. Oh, there's another one. Ooh, if I move, it's gonna fly. Oh, no, no. That's not a step eagle. I don't know what those are. I think uh, they're definitely eagles. Maybe African hawk eagles. They normally occur in pairs. What a pity they decided not to hang around. Very unkind of them. All right, there are some more elephant tracks along here, so that's good news. Let's drive a little bit quicker. Try and leave the gearbox in the car. That's normally a good idea. And people often ask us why it is that we don't have automatic transmission on these vehicles. And it's because we just need that extra control. Hello, Mike here in the Netherlands again. You want to know about when the swallows are going to leave from here and go north. I think it'll probably be sort of around the end of March, and you want to know what signs there will be. The signs that I know of is that they will start to gather in groups. They'll start to fly in larger and larger groups just before they set off, and then they'll head off back to you. It takes about six weeks for them to get to you. That's not, I mean, that's quite a long time, but it is an enormously long distance. Here are some impala and some giraffe. Hooray, Brian. Great action at the giraffe. Two little impala here, or oh, one. You and a lamb. Hello, impalas. That's quite nice to see. Finally, a heartbeat. And here comes some giraffe just out of the side there. There we go. We'll try and get closer to them. Now, earlier, Steffi was talking to you about the late-born Impala, and could that be a late-born Impala? No, I don't think so. I think that's pretty standard issue. But the late-born Impala are a fascinating thing. Now, I'm going to stop right here, where we're hidden amongst the trees, and hope they don't worry too much about us. Big bull at the back, youngster, well, sort of in the foreground, and then beautiful-looking cow. Now, although that might look yeah, like a family, it isn't a family because a giraffe don't really occur in families. The cow and the calf will obviously spend all of their time together, and the big bull will try and find other cows to be around. Maybe she's coming into estrus again. Maybe that's why he's attending to her. And Pamela, you were saying, well, there were no animals around. Well, we've seen giraffe now, and we've seen some elephants. We've seen some impala, we've seen some kudu. We've seen some waterbuck, diker, steenbuck. And I can hear some elephants pushing over a tree there. She is just stunning. Her cheeks full of food. She's chewing with her mouth open, which of course indicates a lack of breeding on her part. See how cunningly I've hidden us behind this tree, Brian. Mm. It's very cunning, isn't it? Very well camouflaged. Yep. 
so camouflaged that you can't get a clear shot. And there's the little calf. And we've been watching that one growing up. I recognize this bunch. I think that one is probably now, I think it was born in probably very early October. So let's call, it, call its birthday the 1st of October, if this is the little bull that I'm thinking of, unless it's not that one, but I think it is. And so that would put it at October, November, December, January, almost five months old. Still got those ridiculous looking tufts on the top of his horns. <laughs> As you can see, he's well weaned. He's che she's chewing his cud with his with his little paint brushes on the top of his head. Hello, Tony in London. You're obviously an ornithologist, and you're obviously quite clued up because you want to know if. Red-billed and yellow-billed oxpeckers are found together often. They are in some areas. If you go a little bit north of here to sort of around the Palaboa region, so about 120 kilometers to the north of this area, you will absolutely see most, well, you'll see them mixed. And then if you go further north of that, the red build start to be replaced by the yellow build. Down here, it's the opposite. It's far more red build than it is yellow build, but we do get yellow build. But absolutely, they're very happy to share a habitat with each other. They do tend to replace each other, though, the further north or south that you go. All right, let's sneak a little bit forward. Let's see if we can't get another look at them. Gracie, if you want to know if I missed you, absolutely I missed you, Gracie. You say you've been very sick, and that's why you haven't been talking to us for the last few days. Well, Gracie, I hope very much that you're feeling much better now. And you say that Scott last said to you that he could have a tea party in the Arethusa airstrip hut with Safari James. Now, for those of you who don't know, Safari James is a rather questionable character made by me out of mud from Bifflesook Dam. And he is Gracie's favorite. Now, Gracie, if he, Safari James is still here when you get here, then absolutely we can have some tea in the airstrip. But I have a feeling, I just have a feeling, Gracie, that you're going to see Safari James before you come to Africa. I don't know why I have that feeling, but I just do. Now, oh, Fluffy G, we've had some wonderful uh, YouTube and Twitter names today. Fluffy G, Fluffy Koala Bear, uh, various others. Um, Fluffy G, you want to know which giraffe subspecies this is. This, of the, well, nine or 11, um, it's difficult to tell what the biologists are agreeing or disagreeing with at the moment. This is the southern giraffe, which is an easy one to remember, of course, because we're in South Africa. So this is the southern giraffe. Mm. Now it is raining in Hoodsprite, I can see that from here. See that? Amazing rain there, falling in Hoodsprite. So Steph's wife and child will be receiving rain gratefully, no doubt. I just wish it would come here. But it seems not to want to at this stage, which is sad. Anyway. Oh. <laughs> I see Mr. Moustache. 
you have um, you've obviously left Iceland and gone home to Michigan. I imagine the temperature is probably roughly the same, though. Uh, you want to know if giraffe get neck ache, or if I think giraffes get neck ache. Um, it's actually quite an interesting question. I don't think they do, no. I think they're perfectly designed. And I think because they don't sit in front of computer screens or drive cars all day, you know, they're constantly sort of doing exactly what they evolved to do. I think you'll find that their necks are loose and supple and possibly until the day they die. And so we only get our, you know, our aches and pains because we do things, we sit all day and we do strange things that we were never designed to do. And we, you know, we play American football yeah, Denver Broncos. We, or we play rugby or strange things like that that our bo bodies simply were not designed to do. And that's where our aches and pains come from. Also, you know, the kind of um, skeletal changes, or not changes, the skeletal abnormalities that human beings have, you don't see the same variation in animals. I think it's because those kinds of sort of abnormalities result in animals not surviving and so they get bred out of the population whereas a human being who has a gammy back or you know a, a club foot for example is not actually that it, it's his survival or her survival or an ability to breed is not actually reduced by having a club foot so something like that you know which, which is genetic will perpetuate in the population and in the animal kingdom that's very different and i'm pretty sure Therefore, uh, the aches and pains that come with skeletal abnormalities don't occur as much in the animal kingdom as they would in the human. You can see this little giraffe now very happily eating zizifus, buffalo thorn trees. Mother's milk is not sufficient anymore. And you may just have been able to hear the dim rolling of thunder. Isn't he lovely? There are some elephants just through there, but I can't go in there, of course, because we're on the we're on the northern edge of where we can go. Look at that tongue. Beautiful blue tongue. <laughs> now, nice question here. And the Latin name, of course, of a giraffe is Giraffa camelo leopardist. Now, Dean, you're in New Hampshire, and you want to know whether, because of that Latin name, they are related to camels. They are not related to camels in the slightest, Dean. The name camelo leopardist does in absolutely come from camel and leopard. Uh, means looks like a leopard. So Leopardus looks like a leopard and a camel mixed together, and that's where the Latin, the specific name, part of the Latin name comes from. They're not related to camels in the slightest. They only have one other extant member of their family, and that is the Okapi, which is a very strange looking creature that comes from the Central African rainforests. So, very nice question, but they don't actually resemble or they certainly are not related to camels in the slightest. I don't know what is related to camels. Ooh, right, okay, everybody, there's a leopard at the Juma Pan. We're going to drive there at an incredible speed. Rusty is going to be put through her paces. I'm not sure if Brian will be on the back by the time we get there. We hope so. I will be either. Right, we need to, where am I going? Hang on, sorry, I'm going the wrong way. We need to take the road down here. Dust. Bye-bye, sorry. So there's a leopard at the Juma Dam. If you want to see it, look at the Juma Dam now. Now, please pay attention to me very carefully. If the Zumi who's watching it can please get a little piece of the horizon, that would be wonderful and just try and find out which direction it's going. Left of your picture is north, right of your picture is south, straight away from the picture is east, and towards or the camera is west. Okay, you got that. Left of the picture, north, right of the picture, south, away from the camera is east, and towards the camp behind the camera 
is west. Here we go. Still at the pan. I'm getting updates from final control as we speak. Looks like it's Karula. I'm not sure what she's doing there. Probably just having a drink. Thirsty work being a mum. You'll excuse me not looking at you. I just do want to get there quite quickly. We're probably about five minutes out at this speed. Maybe seven. I hope she's very thirsty. Oh, it's also apparently a male leopard near Gallagher shortcut. Stations, my radio has been down. Um, reports of male leopard around Gallagher shortcut. Please can I have an update on that. Uh, one thing we, I think, stick to Fanon. Fanon is Corolla, it's not Fanon, it's Corolla. Okay, Kavi, what's the position? Corolla, where are you, Fanon? I'm on... I'm Just on the side of the valley. I'm on a Sandy Patch Tax. Okay, it sounds like it's just Karula. I'm not sure. Somebody said. Not sure. Yeah, I'm going to say Karula. She just put the match here and. All right, and look what we got for you. We got family of dwarf monkeys. And I must be honest with you, this property has got a lot of dwarf monkeys. I absolutely love them. They're one of the most charismatic of the predators that we have out here. I think only something like an elephant shrew uh, would be better. They always look like they're up to mischief. Now, we feature them quite a lot on the show, and that's only because... Uh, there seem to be very healthy populations of, of dwarf mongoose. Now, without joking or anything like that, they live in about a square mile, so not, not a lot of, of, of territory, and they'll have numerous den sites, and this is this particular den site for the evening. Um, they will absolutely change den sites quite often because being the size that they are, they are preyed upon themselves by python by puff adder will take them eagles honey badger will even try i've watched leopard kill them before so definitely although they they eat a vast majority of 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 things out here anything smaller than them they also get preyed upon themselves have a look there's a sentry obviously in the in the entrance to the den they do cooperative breeding very similar to a lot of birds around in that only an alpha pair, alpha male and female, will, will have babies. The rest are made up of adolescents and sub-adults. And as soon as those adolescents and sub-adults mature, they go off to start their own territories adjacent to, and in some instances, a little distance away from their natal territories. They defend their territories against other clans, I suppose you'd say. What would you call a mongoose? A, a, what's a collection of mongoose? Maybe a, maybe a gang. I know a gang. Meerkats are gang. Meerkats are gang. That's what uh, Andrew says. Meerkats are gang. It'd be interesting to know what a collective noun is for a group of mongoose. I'm sure I've known it at some point in my life. I can't absolutely tell you what it is now. You're welcome to send that piece of information through and I'll share it with everyone. But have a look. Very inquisitive and quite bold, actually. I mean, we're sitting in a, in a vehicle many thousands of times bigger than what, uh, what they are, and uh, they're not showing the least bit of fear. 
But I know James is wanting you back with him at the moment, so I think let's quickly cross over to James so he can share what he has. Ah, so James is still having these gremlins cutting in. I'm sure he'll sort them out in a little bit. So for now, you unfortunately stuck with myself and Andrew and what seems to be an, ah, there we go. I was just about to say an empty termite mount. Um, James has got his picture back up and running. Later. Look how lucky we are. Look at that there. There's a young, there's Karula. It would seem, and there's a male. There's a male just the other side there. He's gone into the dam wall there, and we think that was Tingana. So we're right here at the Juma Dam. Just going to move forward. I think this is Karula, is it? Yeah, it's Karula. Isn't that fantastic? So you've seen her twice today. She's not, well, she's quite far from where Stoff, at least Steph, saw her. Probably about three kilometers. Oh, two kilometers as the crow flies. Marking territory, looking very healthy, as Steph said, which is wonderful. And you can maybe hear the monkeys going crazy. Alarm calling at her. There were impala alarm calling at her as well. What a stroke of luck this is. We're going past a vehicle full of people, and they're, they're not even interested in the leopard. They're just staring at the camera, absolutely gobsmacked. All right, what I'm going to do is just get around the corner here so that we can watch her coming towards us. might get a nice view of her here, Brian. There she is. Beautiful shot of her there. What a stroke of luck this is, everybody, to see this leopard twice in one day. Doesn't happen all the time, does it? Looking very healthy indeed, I think. Hello, James Taylor. You want to know if leopards recycle their den sites or if they go back to the same den every time. James, it depends on the den, depends on whether they were disturbed there or not before. Den sites for leopards are not actually that sort of thick on the ground. They're not many of them. They're like caves. They're like very large hollowed out logs. They don't use termite mounds normally. Now, I know we saw her excavating in a termite mound and possibly thinking about using that as a... I'm going to just start the engine in case we have to move. And so, James, unlike the hyenas and wild dogs, which of course have just about every termite mound burrow at their disposal, leopards are not really the same. seems to be coming this way as well. He's coming towards the causeway, which is this, that kind of inlet that we walked past. Um, I'm gonna just see if she goes onto the road or not. Let's just find out. As 
because I'm not. I'm definitely not going to go bashing through here after her. There's too many. There are just too many trees and sticks and things in there. Especially if there's another leopard in the offing. But isn't that a beautiful shot of the queen? stuff. She's very clearly been hunting successfully. Marking territory. Pat, you're in Tampa and you want to know if Karula would have to worry about that male leopard going after her cub. Pat, yes, possibly, except that it's Tingana and so therefore most likely to be the father of any cubs that Karula has. So normally not then if that's the case. Hoping that she's going to pop out onto the road here. And especially if you're watching on the VR rig, eventually, this will be a wonderful picture to the left of the leopard over there. That's stunning. Sammy in Texas, you've made the observation that the leopard spots get bigger towards the back than they are on the front. And there's pretty small ones on the back feet there. They're pretty, they're the biggest in the middle of the leopard. Um, Sammy, I don't know why that should be the case, to be honest. I think it's just to probably break it up so, you know, so that the spots are not particularly regular. And if they aren't regular, means she'll be more and more difficult to see. Sorry, Brian. Jackie stopped there. Now, you can see in the flat light like this, there's no sun shining on her at all. She's not easy to see. She'll happily stand out, you know, just sort of framed by the trees there as opposed to underneath them because it will be difficult for anything to see her framed there. Right, I'm going to leave her if she goes down any further towards the drainage line there. It gets very thick. Just flicking that tail tip to tell the alarm calling birds that she means them no harm. And what we will try and do is go towards the male. So I think. I'm just going to get an update on how many vehicles there are with the male. Andrew, how many vehicles there with you? Um, myself, Abel's coming in. You can join as a thirty more. Basically, of a, yeah, I think we're going to let her go now. Uh, a damn wall. So, yeah, that uh, should be uh, good for the remote. Okay, copy. The female is going into the drainage line now, so I think we're going to leave her. Let's just try and get one more look, everybody. And then we'll go and see if we can find Tingana. She's still there. We're certainly not going to follow her off-road. Let's have one last look at her there. You can see her dappled shape moving off through the bush. Wonderful. That's really happy, happy times to see her. Let's say goodbye to her and let's go and have a look at Tingana. He's just around the corner on the eastern side of the dam wall, as you may have heard Andrew say.
So, from absolutely nothing to, well, basically everything. If you see Garula, you've seen everything, as far as I'm concerned. Sorry, we're just going to quickly synchronize the VR rig. Okay, that's done. <laughs> Sorry, Iggy, your question, I think, if I understood it correctly, is um, would a female recognize, sorry, hang on. Oh, right. Now, Iggy, you want to know if a male would identify a cub as his own strictly by association with the mother. Uh, no, I don't believe so. I think, well, I don't know. My, my thought is that there must be some kind of familiarity, some kind of obviously familiar smell, but I also think that there's an element of the males thinking that offspring are theirs if they happen to have mated with the mother. So I would say I don't know. I would say it's probably got quite a lot to do with smell, though, just given how much or how many youngs, young cubs are killed by male leopards. somewhere in here. Now apparently there is a leopard still on the dam camera. Well, that just goes to show how improved the dam camera is. Three months ago you would never have seen Tingana lurking the other side of the dam just behind the bushes here. Basically, the, I suppose you might say the, well, I'd say the prince and the queen. I'd say the king, of course, and this is purely my opinion. I'd say the king was Mvula. Isn't he a wonderful fellow? He's quite hot, obviously, it's quite muggy, but just look at the muscle definition on his shoulders. I find that just astonishing. His dewlap, that obvious flap of skin that hangs off the front of every male leopard, except Mvula. Mvula doesn't have a very obvious dewlap at all. Just trying to take a picture with my phone, but of course he's much too far away. I might be able to circle him with Photoshop and say there was a leopard over there. You can see he's panting, his belly is quite full. I think he's probably eaten fairly recently. And you can see that the spots, yeah, they have different sizes everywhere, probably the largest in the middle, smaller towards the back and the front. And I would say that's just simply because the more irregular they are, the more camouflaged he would be in the dappled light of the riverine vegetation, just like the stuff that Karula was walking through. That is spectacular. Certainly small around the head. Ah, uh, yes, well, how do you say maybe Karula came to give an update to Tingana on the status of his offspring? Um, Maybe Gerda. I think that you'll find that she was fairly unaware of him. I'm pretty sure you'll find that he was aware of her, though. Isn't he lovely? You can see totally flat light, wind starting to blow, so we're definitely catching the eastern end of whatever storm was blowing in through Hoodsprite. Here we 
we go. Here we go. I had a decent picture of this record and he's gone the wrong way. Where's he gone, Brian? Is he going straight across? Ooh, he's looking at a Franklin and lifted his tail as it started to shout at him. He lifted its tail, his tail in that kind of surrender fashion, which means I'm not after you. There he goes. Off across the back there. All right, we'll try and turn round now. Talan, bam bam. Okay, go. Dylan, you're in Iowa and you want to know if the dewlap on the front of the leopard makes, has any sort of biological function. Dylan, not that I'm aware of. I think it does certain, certainly, well, okay, here, there probably is a function actually. In fact, there's definitely a function now that I think about it. The function, he's just going to have his afternoon constitutional. That's lovely to see. Um, the function, Dylan, would be to protect him during fighting. Male leopards obviously fight more than females do, and so the larger the flap of skin you have underneath there, I guess the more protection you would have, the more protection his throat would have from the bites of another male leopard. And of course, that's, that's not just to him relieving himself, that is laying down a marker, as it were, that this is his patch. He's now looking across towards the water hole there. But totally obvious now, and clearly not on the hunt. That way that he lifted up his tail like that, as soon as that Natal Franklin started going at him, just to say, I'm not after you, relax, take a chill. I mercifully avoided running over the log that he left on the side of the road because if I'd run over that, I'd run over that, the smell assailing my nostrils right now would be utterly appalling. Oh, another one. Oh, that was a different kind. Number one that time. Isn't he lovely? You just try and get around him. He's following Karula, I'm sure. Hey, a lovely question. You want to know how a female leopard would introduce her cubs to a male? The short answer, Rame, is that she wouldn't. She would try and avoid doing that completely. There he is in front of us. Uh, but the long answer, Rame, is that she, if he came across the cubs and she was with him, then certainly she might think about introducing him, but she would normally try and avoid it. It wouldn't be a case of trying to introduce him so much as it would be a case of sort of, it just sort of happening by chance, and she would just try and protect them and probably keep him away. So it's completely unlike a situation you have with lions, for example, which are introduced. Now, this leopard is very close to us. He's only about a meter and a half away from us. And he's smelling where Karula was marking, exactly where Karula was marking. See, and he's now he's showing Fleming. He's lifting up his soft palate to expose the organ of Jacobson and that will, helps him interpret the urine in Karula, or the pheromones in Karula's urine. So normally it would tell him if she was ready to mate, which she really shouldn't be at this stage. It looks like he's growling, he's not at all. He's simply lifting up the tract to the vimero nasal organ or organ of Jacobson. So, Ramey, it's completely unlike 
Look at his lovely eyes. It's completely unlike with lions, where the female will take the male, or take the cubs to the male, and the male will then kind of, you know, he will show some affection. There, he's marking his territory. You can see the spray. Oh, he's look, it looks like he's thinking about going to have a drink. The male would normally not show any kind of affection towards the cubs, Rame. Oops, sorry about that. And there he goes. I think he's going to go and have a drink. This is just too spectacular. Isn't it wonderful? <laughs> the monkeys are alarm calling. Those monkeys are watching this leopard from poof, 400, 300 meters away. You and I wouldn't see him from that distance. That's fantastic. All right, let's go around, pick him up the other side. He's a long troll. Here we go. Very interesting question from Ellen in Arkansas. He's now stalking something. I can't see what he's looking at. He might just be approaching the water hole, just sort of keeping cover in case something's coming down to drink that he could eat. But Ellen. While he does that, you want to know if Karula would change her hunting patterns in accordance with the sort of risks associated with having a cub. Would she hunt smaller prey so that she would be away from the den for less time? Um, Ellen, I don't think so. I think she'd probably kill whatever she could. But then if it was something big like an impala and it was a long way from the den, she'd just stash it in a tree and hope it was still there and go back and feed on it periodically. I don't think she would necessarily um, try to hunt smaller prey. I'm just going to take a chance and get to the edge here and hope that he comes to drink over here. What do you think, Brian? Do you think we're in a good position? Here he comes. that wind, well, you can't feel it, of course, but you can hear it, I'm sure, starting to blow strongly. Here he comes. Look at that. That is just the most wonderful picture. <laughs> Hello, Sandy in Florida. You want to know if we've collected Tingana's scat for DNA testing. Jamie saw him uh, sort of doing his business the other day and mentioned that we do collect the dung every so often. Um, Sandy, oh, here we go, perfect. There we go, Brian, hey? Say I ever get you in a good position. Sandy, um, I think, if, as far as I'm aware, Tingana's dung has been long since collected, so I don't think there's any necessity for us to collect it further. Oh, that's wonderful stuff. That is just beautiful. Brian, do you think the VR can see from there? He didn't like the look of that for some reason. I suspect he doesn't like the taste of it. Ah, now Jerry's just telling me that is precisely where Karula rubbed her face when she got up from the water earlier on. So he's 
definitely very aware of her. This is fantastic. Now, Dylan in Iowa, a very clever question you're asking me is, do males often share the same territory as females? Dylan, they do inevitably because a male's territory overlaps. Look, he's doing this Fleming behavior again because a male's territory, Dylan, overlaps a female. So normally a male will have two or three or maybe even four females within his own territory. They have much smaller territories. And so by default, a female will inevitably occur within a male's territory. This is just fantastic stuff. Don't see this many leopards every day, do we? Especially two stars of our show like this. I might be slightly in the wrong position here. Why don't we try and move around a bit? Or are you happy here? Happy. Move. I'm just going to try and move a little bit so that we can see his face a bit better. Double tap, maybe. No, let's go this way. Is that all right? No, let's go around the other side. I think with your double, yeah, I know, but I think I can't stick that thing into it. Stunning. Perfect. Quintessential leopard drinking shot. London in a tele office. I don't know what a tele office is, but as it has the word office behind it, a tele office. I don't know what a tele office is either. Anyway, you are. Look, he's just getting a fright from the dust blowing by. Anyway, whatever kind of office you were in, it's a good idea to be watching Safari. It'll keep you sane. And you want to know how many, do we know how many leopards there are in the reserve? We don't know exactly. We have a pretty good idea. So we see two male leopards in our particular piece, maybe three in our 1,500 hectares, but they're not on this area permanently. Two or three females that we see, two young males sometimes come onto the area. But there is a very good idea of the total number of leopards within the Sabi Sands, and including all cubs, it's probably somewhere between 75 and 100. And I know that sounds like quite a big gap, but I don't know offhand exactly who's where and how, but certainly the uh, Panthera, for example, which does all the leopard research in this area, they would have a very good idea of how many we had.
Jay, you're in Illinois and you... Oh, look at the picture of his reflection there. Isn't it beautiful? You're querying why he's got that curved edge to the tail. There's actually quite a good reason for it. Well, other than not dragging it on the floor, of course. You see it's white-tipped. It's tipped with white at the end. And what that means is that it's an effective following mechanism and it's an effective flag. So when he's a youngster, his mother will be able to spot that in the bush when they're moving together. And then when he goes out on his own, as you saw earlier, he flicked it up into the air as that Franklin started alarm calling at him, as did Karula when a number of birds started alarming at her. And that white tip to the tail is an indicator that he is posing no threat. He's not on the hunt. Please don't alarm call at me. It's a unique adaptation. I've never seen any other cat with it. I don't think that the pom-pom on the lion's tail serves anything like the same purpose. Fascinating. Now, Brian, I'm a bit worried this thing's going to turn off, so I'm going to just give it a clap. OK, I'm going to clap, everyone. I hope it's not going to disturb the leopard. There we go. I think that'll do it. <laughs> I hope so, because I'll tell you what, that 360-degree shot of that leopard in front of the car will be something epic. Within this pan, of course, there are a whole lot of terrapins, and they're swimming about, hoping for the odd invertebrate to come. And that's one of them in front of his face. That little sticky, arty thing that looks like a piece of mud is, in fact, a terrapin's head, a terrapin's beak sticking out of the water. Hello, Heidi, in North Carolina. You've obviously noticed how incredibly re relaxed he is around the vehicles, and I think you're wondering why. And you, you want to know if perhaps he is, he's grown up with vehicles in the same way that Karula has, and Shadow, and many of the other leopards around the Sabi Sands. Yes, he has, completely. He does actually come from Lion Sands, which is way down in the south. So his existence here is fantastic because it does mean that he brings some genetic diversity to the area. But yes, he's known vehicles since he was a very small fellow. You can see how much they drink. I'm always amazed by the amount that they're prepared to drink and also the quality of the water they're prepared to drink. This is something of a cesspool full of buffalo dung, mud, hippo dung, and well, obviously also the dung of many terrapins and it doesn't affect their bellies at all. Beautiful picture of him there. Extremely lucky we are to spend this amount of time with him. And now we have him all to ourselves, which is even better. Mm. Fantastic stuff, Will. He's having his evening drink. I hope wherever you are in the world, you too are sitting back, inhaling deeply and appreciating this spectacular sight that we're looking at, and perhaps if it happens to be evening where you are, you have your favorite snifter with you, and you're relaxing after a tough day. If you're at the office, I hope that you have a cup of coffee with you, and that you are, have totally foregone any kind of work that you were supposed to be doing, so that you might spend some time looking at Tingana and his reflection in the dying embers of this, I think it's the 10th of February already. Mm. 
Isn't that wonderful? Look at how aware he is. Extremely aware all the time. And Donna, you want to know if leopards might mate with related leopards. So could there be inbreeding? Donna, yes, it happens regularly. And in the cats, apparently, it can take up to sort of six generations before there will be any deformities. For example, I guess a cat might be born with six digits on its feet, for example. That would be an example of inbreeding, if you like. But for six generations or so, it would make almost no difference. So Mvula is from this area. I'm not exactly sure who his parents are. He's, you know, almost 11 years old now. In fact, I think he's almost 12. And his, he, there's no question he will share some of the same genetics as Karula, but, you know, the offspring, Quarantine and Konuma, they're absolutely fine. They don't show any deleterious effects at all, but it is important or why it's so great that Tingana is in this area and that he's been mating with Shadow, who's Karula's daughter, as well as Karula, because he does bring a great deal of genetic diversity into the area. You can see with the wind blowing, he's tremendously aware all the time. He's always looking around the place because he can't hear. If there's a potential threat approaching, he won't be able to hear it. This is exactly the kind of time of night that hyenas might want to come out and have a drink. They'll start moving away from the den now and go out foraging, and he won't want to come across too many hyenas together. One on, his, on their own, he'll, be, he'll slink off or just sneak up a tree and be fine. But he won't want to, them to sneak up on him. Beautiful frame there with the log behind him. Still drinking, 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 drinking away. He's had a lot to drink this evening, this fellow. I'm loath to put a light on him, everyone, just simply because unless we have to, I don't really want to, and we don't have too much time left. So I think if you'll bear with us, if you'll bear with us, I'm just going to let him, I'm just going to let him drink in peace without a, without a light in his eyes. You're right, you're right there, Brian, hey? If he was moving and he was thinking about going to do something around the hunt, I might. And if somebody else was coming up across to look at him, then I might as well. But as he's on his own, I think I'll just let him be. Surrounded as he is by the terrapins. The wind. The smell of the dust, which smells very like a winter's evening, which obviously it isn't. Very little in the way of vegetation smell at all. So the camera is actually showing you light that is not actually here anymore. It's sucking out light from a scene that is all very dark. And as I say that, we had a question this morning while I was walking, I forget from whom it was, but about cicadas and why we're not hearing them even though it's the height of summer. And I said because there was a bit of a drought going and most of them have probably bred already and pressed on. Got, you know, they've had their life cycle. As I say that, there's a cicada firing up behind us. So there are still a few of them around. And it was Cindy this morning who asked us about the cicadas. So Cindy, if you're watching, there are still a couple of cicadas around. Definitely nothing like as um, sort of brain-shakingly loud as they were around October and November. Alrighty, let's nip over to Steph quickly so that he can show you some elephants. I'm going to stay here with Tingana. I'll see you very shortly. And from one mammal drinking to another, and not quite as spectacular on an individual basis, but have a look at how awesome all these ellies are together. And we just wanted to show you this as the sun sets on what's been quite an epic uh, sunset safari for myself and Andrew. I just want to say thank you. I thank you for all your questions and I thank you for all your, your inputs. And
and uh, from myself and Andrew at least, this is going to be the end. We're going to be sending you back to James and back to Tingana who's busy drinking, it seems like, the whole of the dam. And uh, I am jealous. But anyway, we'll catch you in the morning safari. Have a good evening wherever you are. Right, well he's still here, he's still having a drink and as Jerry says it looks like he's drinking the whole of the dam. It certainly does look like that. But what a privilege. So just a few more minutes left everyone. Ruth in Costa Rica, you want to know actually how much water he's getting at a sitting like this. Ruth, I'm afraid I, I couldn't really tell you, to be honest. Um, I don't know. I would say, you know, given what he's able to eat mass-wise, he's about probably 65 to 70 kilograms, maybe, yeah, 70 kilograms or so, and he can eat about mm, up to a quarter, between a quarter and a third of his body mass in one sitting. Look at that, wonderful. Um, I would imagine that he could drink probably a similar amount to the amount that he could eat. So probably about five or six liters. I mean, that sounds like an enormous amount. I'm just gonna put a little bit of light on him just for the last few minutes. That's not a spotlight, it's quite a nice diffused side light. So Ruth, I don't know, I guess maybe a gallon, maybe a gallon in one sitting. I might be completely wrong. But maybe a gallon. Look at him. Isn't he lovely? So this diffused light that we've got on the side of the vehicle is just much more friendly than a blinding spotlight. So he'll be able to sort of see past it. And as Jerry says, he looks very alert. He certainly is alert, but that's because well, he's alert because it's so windy. And so just like the, predator, the prey, you know, the impala and the antelope that are worried about being eaten in the wind, so he will be worried about being sort of set upon by hyenas or anything like that. stuff. All right, so we're going to just give you a slightly different angle by switching to the damn camera. And I'll just give you a slightly different angle of him. He's definitely eaten. And of course, he's also now got hiccups. That's classic. That is hilarious. <laughs> One hiccup. Brian, like you. And leopards will do a lot of drinking after they've been eating. They get very thirsty. Digestion is a thirsty process. And you can see that fat belly. Truly very quiet day until the reports of Karula coming to drink were received. Of course, you saw her twice today, which is extremely lucky for you. And then Tingana, our old pal from the south. All right, well, that's about it from us, everyone. Um, we will see you tomorrow morning. I think, I'm not sure who's driving tomorrow morning, actually. Thank you, Brian, for Thank your you. efforts. Well done. Lovely to have Steph on board again, of course, with Brian. And, of course, Brian's thumb, at least with Andrew, Steph was. And thanks to Kirsty and, of course, to Jerry in the final control. And to all of you, wherever you are in the world, stay safe and happy. 
and I hope that you enjoy watching the damn cam for the rest of the night. We will see you in the morning.